it's, it's Thanksgiving week, and one of the things that I am um, most thankful for in my life is that I had, I had parents who made it a priority that their boys um, know the Lord. My parents are, are Christ followers. They, they weren't, aren't perfect parents, uh, but they knew the importance of making sure their children heard the gospel and knew what it meant to be a follower of Christ. I will always be thankful for that. And one of, the greatest, one of the greatest responsibilities that we have in our families and in our church is to pass on our faith to the next generation. And if we're not intentional about it, if we're not intentional about doing this, the next generation can completely forget God and His faithfulness, forget His love, forget His power, and forget His amazing grace. It actually happened to the people of Israel. If you have your, your Bible, you want to turn into Judges chapter 2, if you haven't done that already, but we're going to be in Judges chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 7 through 10. Judges is in the front part of your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. And so uh, in the book of Judges, what has happened is the, the people of Israel don't have an appointed leader anymore. After Joshua, we're going to talk about this in just a second, after Joshua passed away, then what God did was he brought in different people, different judges, prophets who would, who would speak into to the Israelites and, and tell them what they were doing wrong, tell them what they were doing right, and be God's, God's uh, mouthpiece for, for the Israelites. But just a, a quick history real quick. <laughs> I did that the first service too. A quick history real quick. That's in the office of redundancy. A quick history. The Israelites, God's chosen people, they had been enslaved in Egypt for hundreds of years, and God brought them out of slavery and was taking them to the promised land. And on their journey out of Egypt and to the promised land, God did some amazing, he did some awesome things that showed them that he was the all-powerful God and that he was going to keep his promise that he'd made to their ancestors long, long ago. Now, the people of Israel got close to the land that God uh, was giving to them, but they choked. They didn't, they didn't make it in. They got afraid because of who was in the land already. And I guess maybe that they thought the land would be empty and just kind of all set up and ready for them to go. Kind of like when you walk into a hotel room, um, you, you would be really shocked if somebody was already in there. But no, usually a hotel room, it's all cleaned up, all ready, just waiting for you to come and enjoy uh, the room. And I think that's maybe the idea that the Israelites had, that we were just going to come into the promised land, and it was going to be all set up for them, and they could just come in and take it. But they were going to have to fight for the land. But they were already promised uh, the land. So they were, they were promised the victory, because remember, it was called the promised land, not the, not the maybe land, or, or, <laughs> or it, we'll see how it goes land. It was the promised land. So they rebelled, and they would not go, so God sent them in wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, basically until the generation died off that had rebelled against God. Moses was their leader, and, but because of his disobedience, he was not allowed to enter the promised land either. So Joshua, um, Joshua was appointed as leader, and he led the people into that land that God had promised. And once again, God did some amazing things, some awesome things for for the people of Israel so that they could take the land. And th this new generation was, was the generation who, by God's grace, they, they had defeated the Amalekites. Uh, they had crossed the Jordan River on, on dry ground. Um, they, they had seen, they'd seen the walls of Jericho come tumbling down, come falling down because of the shouts and the trumpets, what God was doing. And they also saw the sun stand still, literally just stay in the sky uh, for a whole time while they did battle. This generation with Joshua, they, they were strong and they were courageous. They were a courageous generation that they led the nation into the land that God had promised them. They were conquering the inhabitants of that land. They, 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 just, they left nothing in their wake. But, and this is, a, this is a big but here, despite the faithfulness of this generation, the next generation behind them grew up not knowing God. Can you imagine how sad it was that Joshua's, when Joshua's generation died off, so did the memory of, of, of the God who had given them so many victories. This generation that, that whom, to whom God was so faithful, that generation spawned a generation that was completely faithless to him. He was, he was a forgotten God. And so that's a little bit of history to where we get to where we are in this passage. And it's in Judges chapter 2, I'm going to read verse 7. Through 10. It says, The people worshipped the Lord throughout Joshua's lifetime, and during, and during the lifetimes of the elders who outlived Joshua. 
They had seen all the Lord's great works he had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the territory of his inheritance in, in Tinneth Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaish. That whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. And here's the key point. After them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works that he had done for Israel. So what happened? What happened there? How did an entire generation forget God? Maybe Joshua's generation was just too busy fighting, fighting the, the, defeating these foreign ar armies that were in the promised land to, to talk to their children about the victories and how the Lord was the one that brought them these victories. Maybe after they'd had many years of, of fighting these wars that the parents, they, they kind of just dropped their guard. They, they got complacent. They were living, now living in cities that they didn't have to build. They were eating, eating the crops, the fruits, and the vineyards of, 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 of things that they didn't, have to, uh, they didn't have to build themselves. Instead of constantly depending upon God, you know, maybe they got lazy. They got spoiled. They were apathetic because now they were, they were living on the spoils of their victory. You see, when life gets easier, it's easier to think we don't need God. Desperation for God, when, when life gets comfortable, desperation for God is quickly replaced by distance from God. But whatever happened, the, never, the next generation never did get the baton of faith from the generation before them. I don't know if you've ever seen a, a, a race um, a, a relay race, a four by 100 relay race. It's a pretty popular race in the Olympics. Um, and, and if you've seen it, you know that, that passing the baton is a key part in that race. It's just as important as, as being fast. Matter of fact, I was looking this up. Um, prior to 1996, because I don't know if you remember the 1996 Olympics, but the, the American four by 100 men's sprint relay team, they were, they were defeated by the Canadians. They were a heavy favorite. But anyway, prior to 1996, the U.S. Olympic team had won 14 of the previous 18 uh, Olympic races. Okay, so the U.S. dominated that. And the only, the only time they lost prior to 1996 was in 1980 when the U.S. boycotted the Olympics. And the other three times were, the, get this, they weren't beaten because they were slower. They were beaten because of an error made when they were passing the baton. In, in, in a relay race that you're given just a certain amount of space, a certain amount of time to pass the baton on. So they didn't lose because they weren't running fast. They lost because they didn't do the exchange right. You see, you can have the fastest four people on the planet on your relay team, but if you don't get the baton pass properly, you lose. And for whatever reason, Joshua's generation didn't pass the baton to the next generation, and the result was a generation who didn't know God. If you look, well, I didn't read these, but if you look down to, uh, after verse 10, you get to verse 11. It says, The Israelites did what was evil in the Lord's sight. They worshipped the, the Baals and abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed other gods from the surrounding peoples and bowed down to them. They angered the Lord, for they abandoned him and worshipped Baal and the Asherahs. Now, I know we can look at Joshua's generation and we can just kind of shake our heads with disappointment and say, what, what, what was the matter with them? But here's what I believe. I believe if we're not intentional, the same thing is going to happen today. The next generation will grow up not knowing God, not knowing about who He is, what He can do, how much He loves us, and, and His purpose for our lives. And some of you may be thinking, how in the world, how in the world does that happen? Well, it happens when we allow life to push God to the side and we relegate him to if we have time for you or in case of emergencies. When we as adults aren't purposeful with the discipleship of our kids, then it won't be long until our kids will see real no reason for God or, or, or no need for God. And, and if, you, if you ever watch the news or look on social media or look online or just observe our culture, you know that this is not a real great environment to be abandoning the spiritual leadership of the next generation. There's a world out there that's ready, willing, and able to instill its own doctrine and beliefs into the hearts and minds of our kids. And by the way, when I say kids, you, you may be thinking, well, I, I'm, 
I don't have kids, or, um, you know, I'm older now, and my kids are all grown up and gone, and, uh, or whatever, but here's the deal. If, if you are a part of a, this church, or if you're part of a church, then you're a part of a family, and as a member of the family, you have a responsibility for the kids that are a part of this. So please don't dismiss yourself from this talk this morning saying, well, I don't have kids. If you attend this church, you've got them. And there, so the culture is quite ready to point out to our kids that, that truth is whatever you want to make it. You decide. Whatever's tr- whatever you think is truth, that's truth. Truth is what seems right to you. What is right, what is good, and what is worthy, that's, that's up to you. you. You do your own thing, and let's just all get along. You do you, uh, and I'll do me, and let's just all be happy. And that sounds really neat, and that sounds really good, but the problem is that the truth that the culture is offering is not the truth of God. And people will, will tell us as believers that, you know, you don't need to push your beliefs on me. You're, you're, you're ignorant, or you're intolerant, or you're a bigot to say that Jesus is the only way, or it's ridiculous to follow an, an outdated old book like the Bible. I mean, come on, this is 2018, almost 2019. We've progressed. We've moved on. It's time for you to move on, too. You see, but the world's message is antithetical to the message of God. And here's, here's the reality. The loudest voice gets heard, and usually the loudest voice wins. So for a generation of adults to stay silent about their faith and their God is basically saying to culture, you raise our kids. You teach our kids about truth. You teach our kids morality. You teach our kids what's important. You teach our kids. But it doesn't, it doesn't matter how good of, of parents we are or how good of a church we are. If we fail to pass the baton of faith and we fail as followers of Christ... Now, I, I totally understand that you can pass your faith on to the next generation, and they can then choose to ignore it. I know that that's a choice that a lot of them make. But the issue here is not what they do with the baton. The issue this morning is, are we baton, baton passers, or are we just passive? Are we passers, or are we passive? So what does it take from a family? And by the way, when I say family, I'm not just including you know family that you live with. I'm talking about church family too. So what does it take from a family to make sure that God the Father does not become God the forgotten? Well, I want to I tell you three important things that we must do as a family so that the next generation knows and has the opportunity to experience God. And here's the first one. We need to be a family that speaks the name of Jesus. We need to be a family that speaks the name of Jesus. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 says, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road when you're going to bed and when you're getting up, getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Did you catch the message there? That language there? It's, it's repeat them. Repeat it to them over and over and over again. And notice who it said to. To the children. Let the children know about God. Let the children know about God's commands. Talk about them all the time. When you're going, when you're coming, when you're going to bed, when you're rising up, it's, it's, it's talk about them. Speak the name of God. Speak the name of Jesus. And I know it, it may seem excessive, but it's necessary because what doesn't get priority is quickly forgotten. What doesn't get priority is quickly forgotten. Later on in Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 20, it says, In the future your children will ask you, And here's the important thing. When they ask you, you have to have an answer. What is the meaning of these laws, decrees, and regulations that the Lord our God has commanded us to obey? Then you must tell them. You must speak to them. You must say to them. We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his strong hand. The Lord did miraculous signs and wonders before our eyes, dealing terrifying blows against Egypt and Pharaoh and all his people. He brought us out of Egypt so he could give us this land that he had sworn to give to our ancestors. 
And the Lord our God commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear him so he can continue to bless us and preserve our lives as he has done to this day. For we will be counted as righteous when we obey all the commands that the Lord, the Lord our God has given to us. We have to be intentional about telling the next generation of what God has done and what he is doing in our lives. We can't assume that they're going to know. We, we can't assume. How will they know if we don't tell them? How are they going to know how God has shaped your life? How are they going to know about God's faithfulness in your life? How are they going to know your struggles and God's lessons in those struggles? How are they going to know about your doubts and what God has spoken to you during those times of doubts? How are they going to know about God in your life if you're not well, willing to share your life with them? Faith isn't passed on by osmosis. It doesn't work that way. Faith isn't, faith isn't something that you're born with. It's not because I'm a follower of Christ, and that means my children will be, are automatically followers of Christ, which means my grandchildren will. It, it, it doesn't get passed on that way. Faith is passed on by adults being intentional about faith conversations with the next generation. And don't forget, what we're unwilling to do, that will leave the door open for, cult, for culture to come in and to compete for our children's affections and their hearts and their minds. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am, I am not ashamed of, of, of the name of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of telling people about Christ. I am not ashamed to pass on my faith to my kids. I'm not ashamed of passing my faith on to the, to the next generation. Why? I'm not ashamed of it because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Why would I be ashamed of that? Why would I not speak of that to the next generation? Because if it's the only thing that's going to save them from an eternity separated from God, it would be foolish for me not to. And it might be darn right hateful for me not to share the gospel with them. There's a lot of things that I, <laughs> that I don't really want to talk about to my kids. You know, the, a lot of things from my past that I don't want, really necessarily want them you know, all the times I was a moron growing up, those kinds of things, and uh, the embarrassing moments as a teenager. I, I don't really want to, you know, open up about all of my failures and, and those types of things. Um, but, you know, there are things, a lot of things that I do talk about with my kids. I talk about stuff that's going on in my life, and we talk about football, we talk about golf, we talk about TV shows, we talk about social media, we talk about friendships, we talk about school, we talk about church, we talk about activities, we talk about a whole bunch of stuff. But one thing that we have to make sure that we talk about with our kids in the next generation is the gospel of God because, like we just said, it's the power of God for salvation. A generation forgets God when the generation before him stops speaking his name. When God is no longer a part of the conversation because God has been crowded out by everything else, then the, gener then the generation after us will forget who God is. So the first thing is we need to speak the name of Jesus. The second thing is we need to be a family that lives like Jesus is king. We need to live like Jesus is king. Now, um, I, I was in youth ministry, uh, youth minister for 18 years of my 20-something years in, in ministry. And so youth ministry just kind of, it's just, a, it's part of who I am. It, it just, it, I, I love youth ministry. But here's, here's, here's what I, I get trouble with sometimes is adults who are talking about this next generation. And we can't get mad at the next generation for living lives that we've allowed them to live. We can't get mad at them for living lives that we've allowed them to live. I hear this all the time from, a, from, from adults. Kids sure are different these days. I wasn't like that when I was a kid. Well, why weren't you? You weren't that way because your parents didn't allow it. Well, kids don't respect these adults these days. Well, why? Because they weren't taught it. You were respectful when you were young because you grew up in a home that valued and taught respect and 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 again i, I don't i don't want to play the game the blame game here but to a great extent our kids are the way they are because we've allowed them to be that way how can i expect my kids to live for jesus if i'm not living for jesus how can i expect 
the next generation to love God's Word if I don't ever open up my Bible? How can I expect my kids to be plugged into the church when I only make it to church maybe once a month? I can't expect my kids to value and respect what I don't value and respect. I can't tell my kids to live like Jesus is king if I live like Jesus is optional. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 says, For God did not call us to impurity, but in holiness. Holiness means that your life is different. Your life is, is counter, counter to what culture says. Your life is, is set apart from the rest. And it's not because you're something special or that you're better than everyone else. It's because you're living, you're living differently because you're living a life that honors God. And you're not trying to live a life that honors yourself. It means you're living for the glory of God and not living for the glory of man. It means that your life points people to Christ and not just points to what everyone else is already doing. And guess what? The next generation, they're watching. I know it doesn't feel like it because most of, most of that generation is like this, but if we're honest, we're like this too. So we can't, we can't, we can't blame them. They're watching. They're listening. But more importantly, they're watching because you know this. What you say, I mean, sorry, because what you do says a whole lot more than what you say. It's common sense. Galatians 2, 19 through 20 says, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You just saw that in baptism earlier. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And so how does the next generation see Christ in you? Do they see it? And, and I thought about this question, and it sort of haunted me a little bit, but here it is. It's, if you decided today that you were no longer a follower of Christ, would your kids be able to tell a difference? Or would life look exactly the same except you would have a couple of more hours of free time on Sunday morning? If I no longer live and Christ lives in me, then that's going to impact everything about me. It's going to impact my marriage. It's going to impact my dating. It's going to impact my parenting, how I do my job, my friendships, my finances, my priorities, my schedule. It will and it should change your life. Jesus as king means Jesus is boss. He's not an advisor. He's not one of the voices that you listen to. He's He's in charge. He's the only voice in the headset telling you what you should do, how you should live. And if we want to make sure the next generation knows God, then we better act like we know him too. John 6, 38 says, I didn't come from heaven to do what I want. This is Jesus talking. I didn't come, to, come from heaven to do what I want. I came to do what the Father wants me to do. He sent me. The next generation will know God matters when it sees the previous generation living like God is the only thing that matters. And the last thing there, as a family, we need to be a family that empowers others to follow Jesus. So we speak it, we live it, and we also have to teach it. That means we have to help the next generation know how to follow Christ. We have to be willing to answer their questions, answer their tough questions, deal with some of their doubts, talk about some of, uh, some of the hard things that they're seeing, discover answers to questions together, teach our kids the Bible, how to study the Bible, help them to know how to apply the Bible, to know that the Bible is, is applicable today, and it's not just an old book that, that, doesn't need to be, that doesn't need to be read or needs to be updated to 2018, but it's God's living word. We need to let them know why church is important, why giving is important, why serving is important, why sharing our faith is important. Talk about all the hard stuff about following Christ because we will, be, we will go through stuff because we've said that we belong to God. And here's a big one. We need to do ministry with the next generation. Together. I think we should look for opportunities to minister together. This generation ministering and serving alongside the next generation. 
Matthew 28, 19, and 20 are, are marching orders as a church, as believers. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. A key phrase in that passage is what we do as disciple makers is we teach. We teach. We need to teach the next generation what it means to be a follower of Christ. Salvation is the starting point to the journey. Coming to know Christ, that is the starting point. But the rest of the journey is helping people to know what to do next. I'm a follower of Christ, okay? Well, what does that mean? What do I do next? And that's a phrase that, that we've said a lot here in this church. It's, it's a phrase called, it's what we say, next steps. And we're all about taking next steps in this church. And we do the next generation a great disservice if we're not intentional with our discipleship and walking alongside them as they take their next steps in their faith. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, Take the teachings that you heard from me, proclaim in the presence of many witnesses, and entrust them to reliable people, who will be able to teach others also. I've been serving in, in ministry for about 27 years, and I, I believe with my whole heart that I am the minister that I am today, good or bad, because of the, of the mentors in my life who lived out 2 Timothy 2.2. They took what they knew, and they just poured it into me. And what they poured into me, God used to shape me into who I am today. And the next generation the next generation will forget God when this generation doesn't take the time to open up and pour into their lives. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 says, this is Paul talking, he says, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. I love what Paul says here. He's, he's basically saying, watch me. Watch me. I can remember growing up learning how to do things by watching my parents. They, they would explain things to me from I mean, all kind, from the gamut of, of, of how to make a cup of coffee, because um, you remember you used to have those coffee filters, and you'd have to scoop enough coffee in there and the water and all that. They, I hated that they taught me to do that, because then when they wanted coffee, they just would just say, Ray, go get us some coffee. Um, so I would do, raise my middle name, by the way, and that's what they call me. Or I was the remote control, Ray, go change the channel, and they taught me <laughs> how to do that. But, you know, all kinds of stuff, like how to mow the yard correctly, how to edge, how to weed eat, how to change a light bulb, how to make my bed, how to do the laundry, um, how to vacuum. They, they taught me all kinds of stuff. And it was always pretty much the same thing every time. They would talk me through the process, and then they would say, watch me. Because they were going to do it. They were going to show me. They didn't just give me the instructions and say, you know, step one, two, three, and then walk away. But no, they, they showed me. They said, watch me. And they, would, they, they modeled it for me, and then they had me do it. They would correct me where I was doing something wrong, or they would adjust, help adjust what I was doing. They'd help me to get it right. Sometimes they would have to show me again, or, or, or a third time. Um, and they kind of helped me how I, how I would think about it or, or help me to problem solve. But I'll never forget them saying those two words, watch me. Why should I watch them? Because they knew what they were doing. Paul told the people in Corinth to remember what they saw him do when he was with them. They, they saw him. They watched him when he first planted the church. And now he's saying meta, metaphorically here, um, because he's not with them when he's writing this letter. He's in another town. But he's saying, watch me. And I can't think of a more powerful discipleship tool for the next generation than to say, watch me. Watch me. Watch me because I'm going to show you how to follow Christ. Watch me because I want to point you to Christ. Watch me because I'm going to show you how to, live, how to love like Christ. Watch me because I'm going to show you how to serve one another. Watch me because I'm going to show you how to give up your comfort to follow Christ. Watch me because I'm going to show you how to let God set your schedule. Watch me because I'm going to show you vulnerability, accountability, integrity. Watch me because I'm going to show you how to forgive and ask for forgiveness. Watch me because I'm going to show you humility and how to let go of pride. Watch me because I'm going to live for Christ. Watch me and I'll show you how to do it too. But one of the things that troubles me is a lot of this generation is telling the next generation, watch that. Look over there. Mm, that, that, that seems good. 
Or here's my favorite. Here you go, church. Here's my kid. Tell him about God. When the reality is that God-given responsibility is the way that he intended it for it to be was for us as adults to say, look at us, because we're going to show you. And not only are we going to show you, but we're going to help you. We're going to walk alongside you. We're going to disciple you. Watch me, and we'll show you how to live for Christ. You know what I've never seen, back to the relay race, you know what I've never seen, and I've watched some of the races, I don't sit there and watch it all the time, and maybe you have seen this, but I haven't. I've, I've never seen someone who's running with the baton, who gets the baton and takes it and just chunks it up in the stands. Never seen that. Never seen that. I've never seen someone who gets the baton and takes it and act like they just want no part of this, like they're running away from the baton. No, when they get it, what, you, what do you see the athlete doing? You see, you see them using all their ability, all their speed, all their strength, everything that they've got, and they're going as fast as they can to hand it off to the next racer. And then here's, here's the, another cool part of the race. Once they pass it on, then they cheer on the next runner. Adults, we have to be a generation that uses everything that we have, all of our God-given strength, our energy, our ability, our resources, our time to make sure that we pass on the baton of faith to that next generation. And as we do, let's pray and let's cheer for the next generation. Let's not get mad at the next generation. Let's not beat dog on the next generation. They're just, they're just kids. They don't know any good. They're, it's not like I used to be. The, the world is different, blah, blah, blah. Sure, it's different, but what, you know what this world needs? The world needs our faith. The world needs Christ. And so as this generation, what we need to do is with everything that we have, we need to take the baton of faith and we need to pass it on. And when we pass it on, we need to cheer them on. We need to pray for them. We need to walk side by side with them because guess what? There's a culture out there that wants to rip them away from God. But what we need to do as the church and as families is to hang on to them with everything that we've got and say, don't let go. Take this baton and run. I am running with you. That's what we need to do. May we never abandon our responsibility of speaking the name of Jesus, living like Jesus is king, and empowering the next generation to follow Jesus. Because the sad truth is, if we don't, the next generation will not know God. He'll be the forgotten God. 